Good morning. Good morning. Psalm 4. To the chief musician on Neganoth, the Psalm of David. Hear me when I call, O God of my righteousness. Thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. Have mercy upon me and hear my prayer. O ye sons of men, how long will ye turn my glory into shame? How long will ye love vanity and seek after leasing, Selah? But know that the Lord hath set apart him that is godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. Stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still, Selah. After the sacrifices of righteousness, and put your, offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. There be many that say, who will show us any good? Lord, lift thou up the light of thy countenance upon us. Thou hast put gladness in my heart more than in the time that their corn and their wine increased. I will both lay me down in peace and sleep, for thou, Lord, only makest me dwell in safety. Please pray with me. Father, it's a, a joy to be in your presence and to sing your praises and to recognize the power that you want to flow through your believers. Father, I'm looking forward to hearing how the power of the Holy Spirit is flowing through believers in other parts of the country next month, and I pray that many will come to hear those stories. I'm Looking forward to hearing how your power is going to protect your people as Israel comes more and more under attack. I'm looking forward to the stories of how your power flows through your people in this congregation as we are more and more every week equipped with your word and with your spirit to share what we know about you. And as we do that, Father, we pray that you will continue to draw more and more people, not just into your kingdom, not just more and more people preparing for the coming of our king, but this congregation will grow and there will be more young people sitting in these pews learning and preparing to be the leaders for the next generation. Father, we offer this all to you because we are finite and we do not know the perfect responses to our requests, and we have no power to enact them anyway. We ask you to be glorified in the, your response to what we present before you today. In Jesus' name, amen.
I want you to imagine being in this building and thinking you're all by yourself. And the first thing you hear is them practicing. I don't know how many times they have come in to prepare for that, and I have wondered if I have missed something. It's really a pleasure and joy to hear people using their skills. Oh, that's right. We need the ushers back, or we need the children back. This is the day that we're going to do the noisy offering. So, how many children do we have here this morning? Before we dismiss the kids. They're right up here, buddy. Yeah. Lila's here. Uh, I don't know if anybody else is here, but the Verlin will help, and maybe one of the ushers will help. We're going to take the noisy offering. Now, you may not know what a noisy offering is, okay? So I'm going to demonstrate. I have my little coin pouch here. And what you're supposed to do with your coins, Lila, will you hold your bucket out here? You're supposed to take the bucket and you're supposed to pour your coins in and make as much noise as you can with those coins. This is a joyful noise to the Lord. So we're going to go ahead and have a, a little offering and then all these coins are going to go into the coin jar for missions. Okay, she, Lila says she's going to get more than Verlin, so the, the, the race is on. So go. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Verlin's in a hurry. He wants to get more coins than Lila. Hey, if you can get those coins to bounce, then make them bounce. Again, all of this is going to go for missions, for helping people in other parts of the world hear the truth of Jesus Christ. Most of us will not have the privilege of going. And so we have the privilege of sending. Once you get a, a base of coins in there, it's harder to make them loud, isn't it? <laughs> oh boy. Still have some more coins coming. We got a bucket full coming up here, guys. One of the reasons we have the children do this is they fit down the rows. <laughs> and, and to be honest with you, because it's kind of hard to look those little kids in the eyes and not have something to put in there. So it, there's, there's some ulterior motives here, but we do have a good, good cause that this money goes to. <laughs> get Stan, get Stan. Mate, don't leave Stan out. Tickle him, make him drop them all. There you go. All right. Okay, now you can set them down right there. And we have, we have a coin counter that will count those for us. But before you sit back down, I want to pray. For this money, okay? Father, we're thankful for the generosity of the people here at Grace Mennonite Church. Thankful for the children's willingness to participate in your mission program. And, and as your word says, to be, be part of the mission success that's happening all over the world and to receive the reward that missionaries receive because they're participating in this. And I ask that this money that's collected will be used in a way that prepares this world for Jesus' return, calls more and more people into his kingdom. And I ask you for this blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. That's so awesome to have that happening. We do have the children's church, and we'll go ahead and dismiss the children's church at this point. 
We have children's church and a toddler's room for your friends if they want to bring their kids. We also have a room in the back corner that's a little darker that if you have infants and you decide you need a break from the large group, there's a place for you to go back there as well. Um, I would like to ask the Lord to bless us as we look into his word this morning. I've got an, an awful lot to say and I'm going to try real hard to get it in in the time limit so that the children's church workers don't have to invent things on the fly to continue their class. So please bow with me as we ask the Lord's blessing. Father, I thank you for the, the privilege we have of looking into your word and the, the guidance it gives us for how to live yet even today. And as we look into the preparation that you gave your apostles, that that preparation would continue down through the centuries even to us and allow us the privilege of being prepared for the outreach that you have for the city of Enid, Oklahoma. Father, guide us today for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. This series that we're going through now, it's six or seven weeks now, we're going to talk about what happened after the resurrection. If you remember last week, we started this series, we looked at the doubts that the apostles had on the day that Jesus was resurrected and how he alleviated those doubts. We're going to go the next few weeks and talk about some of the events that happened after the resurrection, and sometimes we're going to talk about the, the benefits of the resurrection, what happened because of the resurrection. Today we're going to be in Luke chapter 24, and as we look at this, you're going to recognize it very quickly as a parallel passage to what we saw last week. Last week we looked at Mark's version of the first Sunday evening after the resurrection, And we saw last week how he alleviated the doubts that the apostles had. We talked about doubting Thomas. This week, we're going to look at how he used that opportunity to prepare them for the ministry he had called them to. Now, if you remember Luke's outline, on the day of the resurrection, Luke gives the story of the two disciples going to Emmaus. And Emmaus was a village about seven or so miles away, and they're walking back to their home. Uh, I believe that it was a man and a woman, a, a husband and wife, that were walking together. Uh, gives the name Cleopas for one of the disciples, doesn't give the other disciples names. That would be a first century way of saying that they were married. Also, they went to the same house and had dinner together, and that would kind of indicate that they were family and so probably married. Well, they are talking to Jesus without knowing it until Jesus breaks the bread and offers the blessing. Then their eyes are open and they see that they've been talking with Jesus himself. Well, they immediately leave and go back to the apostles and tell them that they have seen the resurrected Savior. Then Luke picks up the story here in verse 36 where he says, As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bone, as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they were still disbelieved, For joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate before them. Then he said to them, These are the words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Now, I want, I want to be open and honest with you here. That something might surprise you about me, uh, surprise me when I became a pastor, that as a pastor, it's actually harder for me to share my faith than it was when I was working at a secular job. Uh, part of the reason is when people find out that I'm a preacher, they, they kind of avoid me. 
I, they get the, um, the attitude about them that I see they have when they see their friend who's a insurance salesman showing up. Kind of like they're afraid I'm going to give them the sales pitch again. But there's more to it than that. It's, it's actually more difficult for me to rub elbows with people who are not already believers. Before I was a preacher, I could count the number of friends I had who were not believers all day long. I mean, almost everybody that I ran into in the hospitals and in the fire departments were not believers in Jesus Christ. But now, most of my time is spent with the, the flock, the people who are already believers of Jesus Christ, or actually, a lot of my time now is spent with other pastors, as I've been called to some other, other opportunities to bless other pastors as well. I have found out, though, that if I'm careful, when I do meet someone who's not, or I'm not sure is a believer, I, I have a kind of a technique or a script that I can use. One of the first things I am very careful to do is not tell them that I'm a preacher. I'll let the conversation kind of go the way it would normally go. You know, you talk about your family and your occupation, you talk about what you do for fun, and then the conversation kind of dwindles, and then I'll ask them what they do for a living. Somewhere in there, I'll ask them about their job. And out of politeness, they will ask me. And if I'm feeling really ornery, I tell them I'm a public speaker. And then I just let it go wherever it'll go. But most of the time, I, I realize I don't have that much time, unless, you know, I'm on an airplane or something. I'll just tell them outright, I'm a preacher. And then you can just see the look on their face change. Yeah, every time it's, oh, oh no, what did I say? What, what vocabulary did I use? You know, like they're going to shock me or something. And then I I'll, 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 won't wait very long. I'll ask them, where do you worship? I'll assume that they're going to say they do because everybody in the United States is a Christian, right? And so they go to church somewhere. So I ask them, where do you go to church? And most of the time, they'll say one of the big churches. One of those churches where they could say they went to church, but nobody would miss them if they didn't show up. And so I'll, I'll turn the screws just a little bit more, and I'll say, really, how often do you go? Once in a great while, I run into the honest person that says, well, I go every Easter and Christmas. But most of the time, it's every once in a while, or whenever I can, or some vague question like that. It gives me the opportunity to say, well, then do you spend any time thinking about spiritual things? That catches them off guard. They'll say, well, what do you mean? I say, well, what do you think about Jesus? What's your opinion of Jesus? And then I can just let the conversation go. What that has taught me is I've learned to do that. And to be honest with you, that's not original with me. I got that from, from a book called Learning to Share Jesus Without Fear. And it showed me that sharing my faith in Jesus Christ, even as a pastor at this point, can be learned. It's something I can learn about and be able to uh, increase my skill. The problem is many believers never prepare to share their faith. And it produces one very significant negative by not preparing. It leaves them nervous. Nervous about failure. Well, what if I can't get them to sign on the dotted line? I'm just going to let you off the hook on that one right now. You don't have to convince them of everything, anything. You are a witness. You just tell what you know. Leave the conviction and the conversion to the Holy Spirit. Just say what you know and walk away. The Spirit will do His work. It leaves us also with kind of a nervousness about offending people. Because most of the time we're talking to someone we like. And if we offend them, then maybe that'll change the relationship. And we kind of like our family, and we like our friends, and we like our coworkers, and we don't really want to offend them. It leaves us also with the nervousness of confusion. Will I come off sounding confused? Or will I be so confused I won't be able to make the message understandable? I don't believe that is unique to the 21st century. I believe that that's the whole reason Luke recorded this passage for us today. Remember, Luke is writing to a different audience than Mark was. Mark was writing to Romans, and to a large extent, Roman soldiers. 
Historically, we know that the Roman military actually spread the gospel across the empire faster than the individual apostles could because they were transferred quite often. Luke is writing more to Greeks. In fact, he's reading to one specific Greek named Theophilus, a man who is wondering about Jesus and needs to know a little more information and would kind of like to maybe follow Jesus, but isn't quite ready yet. Fortunately, we know it worked because the second book that Luke wrote is Acts, and he writes to Theophilus in Acts as if he's already a believer. Luke chose to phrase his recording of what happened on that first Resurrection Sunday more from the preparation standpoint for the message that the apostles was, were going to deliver. He starts out by recognizing the confusion that it's going to cause. These two believers are reporting to the apostles, we've seen Jesus, and all of a sudden, poof, there's Jesus again. He got into the locked room somehow, miraculously got in there, and says, peace to you, and then he looks around, and everybody's freaking out. They're all confused. They're dismayed. They don't know what's going on. So he says, slow down. Think about it for a minute. I am really him. See my hands and my feet? I've got the marks. Touch me. Feel that I'm flesh. I'm not a ghost. They go on to say, we need more proof. They're not quite convinced. He asks them for broiled fish, and he eats. And everybody knows that ghost doesn't eat. They don't have a body. They don't need to, to feed their body so they don't eat. And so he's acknowledging this confusion and, and recognizing that that is the smart place to start. Start with the expected confusion. The same kind of confusion we would have today. Very few of us, let's just be honest, none of us have seen a physical resurrection ourselves. No one has ever been resurrected in our presence. None of us have gone to a funeral and heard somebody knocking on the inside of that box. Let me out, let me out. People who die stay dead. And so when we talk to people about the resurrection, they're going to have some confusion about that. Some, I would say even some resistance to it. And that is healthy. And that's to be expected. And we need to be prepared for that. Jesus prepares his apostles by giving them the evidence that they need. He says, look, that's with your eyes, see my hands, see my feet, see my body, touch me, see my, feel that I have physical substance, feed me, I will eat with you, hear my words, you have firsthand experience with the fact that I have been risen from the dead. We also have firsthand experience with Jesus. Anybody who has put their trust in him has felt that testimony of the Spirit in your life. As it says in Romans chapter 8, that the Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are in fact children of God. Many of us can give testimony of how we've lived the way Jesus instructed us to live and how that's changed our life and improved our relationships. Those, those experiences are things that we should keep in mind as we're talking to people who are not yet believers in Jesus. He ends by telling them that they have help available to them. Notice how he tells them, says in verse 45, then he opened their mind to understand the scripture. He says that differently than Mark did. Mark said he breathed on them and gave them the Holy Spirit. But he's opened their mind now to understand the scripture that the prophets had prophesied that this would happen. That's an important piece of evidence for those who would be working with the Jews. Because the Jews would see that evidence and it would convince them that Jesus fulfilled the requirements for being a prophet. I'm sorry, for being their savior. Then he goes on to say, and that repentance... For the forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. And you are the witnesses of that. So you're going to go into Jerusalem to start and then move out throughout the entire world, proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Fortunately, he doesn't call all of us to go to other parts of the world, but he might call us to cross the street and give the evidence that we know for Jesus Christ's resurrection. 
in this passage, Jesus has given them what they need to know in the first century. They need to know that they are the eyewitnesses. And in both the Jewish and the Greco-Roman cultures, an eyewitness carried a lot of weight. If, the, if you said you saw something and you were of the kind of character that you never lied about the things that you saw, that would be enough to convince many, especially of the Greek people, who were very philosophical and very um, thinking-oriented. So, what do we say today? I personally am not an eyewitness of Jesus Christ's resurrection. I did not see it with my own eyes. I, I realize that some of you in this room are a little older than me, but I don't think you're old enough to have actually seen the resurrection of Jesus Christ. For some of you, you'll be offended. Others of you will get that joke tomorrow morning. So what I want to offer for you today, very practical help, is uh, something that helped me several years ago when I was looking for evidence of the resurrection. I came across a website that I have begun to use almost every day. The website is called Bible.org. And if you want to get on Bible.org sometime and use their search engine and find the article, Proof of the Resurrection, you will find this article, which this particular infograph came from. And I thought about printing this infograph for you. And I tried to print it, and it came off so blurred that I could not possibly disseminate it. No one would be able to read it. But it's based on something that immediately touched me because I tend to think in acrostics, memory aids. And their premise, which I really like, is that God's power, that's going to be an acrostic, is evidence for the resurrection. What I really like about this is that there are nine evidences in the acrostic God's power. By the way, I did print an outline of it on the back of your, um, your fill-in-the-blank outline for the message. So if you want to look at that, um, that'll be great. And I'll tell you what else you can do with that in a couple of minutes. But what I, one of the things I like about this is only one of the nine items of evidence are Scripture. Many of them refer to Scripture and can, and can be referred in Scripture about, but they are not presenting Scripture as the evidence. Because one of the things especially young people don't like is, is when you present the Scripture as evidence for Christ's resurrection. They consider that presenting itself as its own evidence for itself. They've been told by their professors and teachers that the Bible is tainted, it's been rewritten, it's, been, it's, been, it's evolved over the centuries, and so you can't trust the Bible. So here we have eight evidences that do not rely on the Scripture for proof. The one that does is the word gospel. So the very first letter in God's power is gospel, and we have to turn to the gospels first because the gospels is the only source that gives us all the details about the resurrection. Everything else we see has to align with what the gospels say. Now, I could talk about the preservation of the Scripture and how that proves the existence of God, but we're focusing today on the resurrection. And so the Gospels give us the details of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The second letter is O, and it stands for the Old Testament predictions. That's actually one of the things Jesus gave us in this passage today, that he fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies. Two of them in particular one is the prophecy of Daniel. Daniel prophesied what the world would be like between the close of the Scriptures, the Old Testament Scriptures, and the coming of Messiah. So detail, in such detail that you could plot them out and, de and determine a date. And Jesus actually arrived in Jerusalem on Palm Sunday on that date. The second primary one, there's over 300 prophecies that Jesus fulfilled in the New Testament not all of them pertain to the resurrection, but the second primary one pertaining to the resurrection is in Isaiah 53, where it describes the crucifixion, it describes the piercing, it describes the scourging, and it describes the resurrection. Those are very significant evidences because each one of those was written at least 500 years before Jesus was even born. And those predictions were outside of his control. The D in God's power stands for the disciples' lives. 
Most of us are aware of the fact that the disciples became very bold proclaimers of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In fact, as you read through the Bible this year, when you get to the book of Acts, look for all the times the messages in the book of Acts refer to the resurrection and the crucifixion. I'll give you a little spoiler. There's almost no mention of the crucifixion at all in the book of Acts. It's all about the resurrection. They died proclaiming that. And if they knew that it was a lie, that, the, that Jesus had not been resurrected, at least one of them would have said, wait a minute, I don't want to die for a lie. But they all died proclaiming Jesus was resurrected. When you consider how timid they were before the resurrection and how bold they were afterwards, that also supports the fact that something real happened. Now for me, one of the most important letters in this acrostic is the S, the skeptics' conversions. If you read very carefully, you get to 1 Corinthians in the Bible, you will see that Paul is writing and along with him is writing a man named Sosthenes. Nothing else is said about Sosthenes at that point. But if you go back again, and there should be a footnote in your Bible if you have cross-references, if you go back again to the book of Acts, to Acts chapter 18, the Jews have arrested Paul and taken them before Gallio, the brand new Roman prefect in Corinth, and accused him of crimes, and Gallio refuses to hear the case because it's not Roman law that's been violated. And the Jews get so mad that they grab the synagogue leader right in front of Gallio and beat the tar out of him. That synagogue leader was Sosthenes. And the assumption is, this is my reading between the lines, Sosthenes was left on a, the ground, a puddle of beat up flesh. And Paul came up to him afterward and said, let me help you. And the church came to Sosthenes and said, let's put bandages on those wounds. Let's put oil on those wounds. Come on over here and we'll take care of you for a little while till you get stronger. And the love of Christ showed through and Sosthenes was converted. Another biblical example is James. James was convinced at one point in one of the Gospels, it says that he and his mother went to Jesus to collect him. That means they thought he was crazy. They were going to put him under protective custody. And yet we have the book of James now, after the fact of Jesus' resurrection, that James was converted to believe in Jesus. And history tells us that he was the first pastor of the first church ever on planet Earth, the church in Jerusalem. We have modern examples too. Some of you have heard the name Josh McDowell. Josh McDowell was a law student. And he decided he was going to prove the Bible wrong. Jesus was never resurrected. And I'm going to do a legal examination of the evidence and prove that it never happened. The result was a book called More Than a Carpenter. A simple presentation of the evidence that Jesus is the Christ. He also wrote a book that every one of us should be familiar with called Evidence That Demands a Ver Verdict. It's about that thick. And all it is, is is like three by five card notes of evidence that Jesus Christ is who he said he was. And a great deal of that book is contributed to the proof that Jesus was resurrected. If you do any YouTube searching and you do any Christian YouTube searching, you will run across a man named, i try to say this right, Mozab Yusuf. You recognize that name, anybody? This means no, this means yes. Mozad Yusuf. He is the son of the um, sheik of the West Bank, the Palestinian organization. He has converted to Jesus Christ. He looked at the evidence of Jesus Christ's reality and saw the love of God showing through the people of Jesus who used Jesus' name that he couldn't see anywhere else. And he began to look into that and became converted into a believer in Jesus Christ. And now he has YouTube. He's, he's, he, I don't think he has his own channel. He may, but most of what I see is other people uh, interviewing him, showing the evidence that Jesus really is who he said he was. And only by following Jesus can we have peace in the Middle East. There are a number of other 
names that you might recognize. I would um, re refer you to Wikipedia. Wikipedia actually has a page of unbelievers converted to Jesus from atheism. There's hundreds of names on that page. For me, that is a very strong evidence that Jesus was resurrected and is still alive and working today. You might consider Paul's change. When I was in college, one of my professors described Paul as hell's worst wolf converted into God's gentle sheepdog. He set out to kill everyone who believed in Jesus Christ until he met Jesus Christ. And then he became the, a contributor to the New Testament, in fact, writing half the books that we have that we call the New Testament today. The next two are going to focus on a specific argument against Jesus, the argument that the, the statement that Jesus rose again did not appear anywhere until 300 A.D., until Constantine took over the church as the Roman Empire emperor. That's when the resurrection was introduced into Christianity. Two evidences that that is not true. First is the oral tradition. Again, the Bible does not prove this, but the Bible has the evidence we need. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we have Paul writing to the city of Corinth in the year 55 AD. We know what year it was written. 55 AD. And in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, I delivered to you as of first importance that Jesus Christ lived, died, and rose again. And he appeared to the apostles, to James, to 500 people at the same time, and last of all to me. Now that is Paul deliver, uh, writing down the fact that years before, probably somewhere around A.D. 50, he had come to Corinth and verbally told them, Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. That's less than 20 years after the fact. That's not three centuries later. That's less than 20 years after the fact. We have oral tradition documented very early on. We also have written tradition one of the people who wrote about Jesus was a man named Clement of Rome. He was the bishop of Rome at the end of the first century. And in the year 95, we have a letter that was delivered from him to the city of Corinth again, in which he mentions the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That was in 95. A man named Polycarp, just a few years later, uh, the next bishop of Rome, wrote to Philippi, in the year 110, mentioning the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We have an oral tradition and a written tradition very early. Early enough that it could have been falsified by people who experienced it firsthand and knew that it was a lie. But we have no falsification. Jesus Christ was risen from the dead. For me personally, the E is the most powerful one. The empty tomb. I use air quotes with that, the empty tomb, because it wasn't empty. When the women went to the tomb that Sunday morning, there was still the grave cloths in the tomb. Now think about that for a minute. These grave cloths have been carefully taken off the body, folded, laid aside. Who would do that? If the apostles were stealing the body, would they undress it first? Or would they for protecting the dignity of Jesus, leave the grave clothes on. If it was just a grave robber who was looking for something valuable, would he take the body but leave the grave clothes? You could easily bleach those grave clothes and sell them again. If it was the Romans, why would they take the grave clothes off and carefully preserve them? If it was the Jews, why would they preserve the grave cloths? The fact that the tomb wasn't empty and what was there is evidence that something illogical happened. No human being would do that. It's evidence that Jesus was resurrected and took the time himself to prepare the evidence for those who were coming. 
The second part of that is where did the body go? The, uh, the Romans were paid, the Roman guards were paid by the priests to say that the apostles stole it. Well, then why did they die proclaiming a lie? If the Romans moved the body, and they might have moved the body for security purposes, but why didn't they produce the body when Peter stood up just 50 days later and said, Jesus Christ is risen again? Same for the Jews. If the Jews had stolen the body for whatever reason, I have no idea why they would. I mean, just look at their Jewish laws. That would make them ceremonially unclean. Why would they steal the body? But if they did, why didn't they just produce one? They, could, they didn't even have to produce Jesus. They could have simply produced any body that had been flogged, that had been crucified, and that had been pierced with the spear. Oh, yeah. They didn't have another body. That was not the typical way that the crucifixion progressed. And so they didn't have a fake that they could present. The empty tomb for me, it was huge evidence that Jesus Christ really did rise. But more than that, we have the record of the day. That's the R in our acrostic, God's power. The R is the record of the day. There's a man named Josephus. He was a Jewish man, and he was hired by the emperor to write the history of the Jews. Because remember, starting in AD 70, the, the Romans started conquering Israel again and exporting them all over the world. And in order to keep the record straight... Josephus was supposed to record that. And when he got to the time of Jesus' death and resurrection, there's an entry in Josephus' documents that say, at that time there was a man named Jesus who went about doing good. He was arrested by our leaders. He was crucified by Pontius Pilate. He died and came, three days later came back to life. And his followers believed he was the Christ. Now, that document has been under attack for, for decades now. All uh, People who want to prove Christianity wrong have been attacking that document, saying that's, that's not true, that was added by Christians after the fact, that Josephus never said that. And the real argument that they have for saying that that can't possibly be true is that it's just too good to be true. It fits too well with what the Christians like. So clearly they doctored it. Except they never take into account that there is a separate line of the recording of Josephus' documents that were under the control of Arabs all along. And their document contains that. Their document says that Jesus Christ came and did good and was arrested by our leaders and persecuted by Pontius Pilate died and rose again, and his believers believed he was the Christ. There is another person named Tacitus, who somewhere towards the end of the, um, the first century of Christianity, wrote a letter to the Roman, Roman government. He was a, a governor. He wrote a letter to the office of the emperor needing advice. He says, I've got these Christians. What do I do with them? The response was, if they'll say Jesus was not raised again, let them go. That's at the end of the first century. The Romans are testifying that there's a widespread belief that Jesus rose from the dead. Now, I can look in your faces. It's a little bit brighter up here than it is out there, but I can see your faces, and I can see some of you are a little bit overwhelmed Okay, that's nine pieces of evidence that I seem to be asking you to memorize. Don't do that, okay? Just leave that list in your Bible, and for the next month or so, every, every few days, take it out and look at it, and see which two or three of those really speak to you. For me, it was the skeptic's conversions and the empty tomb, and really drill down on those. Remember those, because that's what means something to you. Remember, it's not our job to close the deal. It's just to testify to what we know. And if we do that, then we'll be better prepared for what's coming. And that leaves us this morning with basically two questions. The first question is, isn't that enough? What more evidence do you need if you're not yet a believer in Jesus Christ 
to surrender to the truth that Jesus Christ is who he claimed to be. He really is the risen Son of God. And there's no reason to continue to resist that. His arms are open. Now, there are no nails holding his arms open for you. Come to Jesus and receive his gift of his love and his salvation and his eternal security and his significance to your life here on earth. There is enough evidence to believe it. The second question applies to people who already have received that gift. Is this too difficult? Is it too hard to be well familiarized with one or two pieces of evidence for the resurrection? I would, pres I would argue that it's very simple to connect yourself to one or two pieces of evidence that speak to you and convince you that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. And if you're truly a believer in Jesus Christ, then you should have had that internal evidence of the Spirit speaking to you and confirming to you that you are indeed a child of God. Pick up one or two pieces of evidence that might help your friends understand that to be true as well. And if you do, if you just, just try to prepare just a little bit for those opportunities to share your faith, you're going to have a clarity on what to say that surprises you. And it'll surprise your friends. Because you'll know what the evidence is. that Evidence that really means something to you. You'll also have a confidence when it comes to being offensive. Because we know we're going to be offensive. Jesus said, pray for your enemy. He assumed you would have enemies. Jesus said that when people come to faith in me, the house would be divided. Two against three and three against two. You'll know that there's going to be an offense. But you'll know you've offended for the right reason. That it wasn't you that was offensive. It's the message that they're offended by. And also you'll have the courage to fail. Because you don't have to know all the evidence. You only have to know the evidence that matters to you. And you can then present the evidence and maybe you won't convince them. But maybe somebody else will come along later and present their evidence. And somebody else will come along after that and present their evidence. And the evidence of your life and their lives will convince them that Jesus has done something. And that Jesus wants to do something with them. And so if you don't see instant success, that's not a failure. That's just another step in the process that they need to be convinced that Jesus is who he claimed to be. You see, a rational resurrection is easy to talk about. It's easy to defend. And it's powerful enough to bring conversions. So please be praying that God will bring people into your life that you can share your evidence with and see their life changed. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for the evidence that's available and for the minds you give us to help us understand it. And Father, may we be equipped to effectively take advantage of those opportunities you give us to share our faith in Jesus Christ in a rational, understandable, and convincing way. Not for our glory, but for your glory. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.